The 30s were a rough time for labor relations in the United States and pension contributions. Not for him, the banks or traditional investments. He poured the money into potentially much more lucrative real estate investments in Las Vegas and Florida, projects which were firmly controlled by members of the Mafia. Many of the decisions were made by Hoffa alone, and few other officials in the Teamsters had the authority or knowledge to question him. In all, more than $50 million of Teamster money was siphoned into the crime syndicate's boom town. Kickbacks and secret loans became commonplace, and many of these were never repaid. But by 1960, these activities had raised so many questions that Hoffa was spending much of his time going to court to answer charges arising from what he regarded as Robert Kennedy's vendetta. He was using nearly a hundred lawyers, all paid for by the union. In 1962, Hoffer exploited his re-election as president of Local 299 to show how solidly his members were behind him. For the first time since 1937, he faced a challenge. Every weekend, he flew back from whatever part of the country his duties as union president had taken him to, to campaign for his seat. If we had three or four more houses in this country, that would be all we need. There was little doubt that he enjoyed both the backing and friendship of many of his members. He had always made a point of being accessible to them, and now they returned his trust. For most of them, he was a leader who had vastly improved their pay and working conditions, and they were not too worried about how he had achieved this as they went to the polling booths. Outside observers confirmed that the election was run totally honestly, and Hoffa won by 3,615 votes to 208. Kennedys aren't going to make a football out of this team, Sir Junior, not while we're around. I guarantee you. I guarantee. Well, I tell you, Bobby Kennedy's over here running in proxy, you see. Junior, uh, did you say Bobby Kennedy was here by proxy, or he's a doxy? He's worse than that. He's a touch football player. <laughs> but the football player, now Attorney General, was still on his trail. First came a charge for assault by a disgruntled Teamster aide. Then it looked like a touchdown when Kennedy put his quarry on trial for widespread bribery with union funds. The defense carted filing cabinets into court to counter each charge as it came up. Hoffer was unrepentant and confident. And since we don't know which witness or which loan is going to be discussed during the course of the day, we're forced to bring to the courtroom all of our files to be in a position irrespective of what witness or what loan. We can immediately reach in the file and have access to the information to defend ourselves. Despite the troubles of their president, outside the courtroom the Teamsters flourished. The membership was largely divided between those who didn't believe the charges and those who didn't care. In the event, the government decided not to proceed with the assault charges, and the bribery case collapsed with a hung jury. The greatest threat to Hoffa came when a former mental patient tried to shoot him in court with an air pistol. But this good luck did not last. The government brought new charges that Hoffa had bribed jury members to ensure that the trial would collapse. It then charged him again with diverting huge sums of money from the union's pension funds. Hoffa fought back. I have an affidavit in my possession signed by a former employee working for Walter Sheridan who returned works for the Justice Department, Bobby Kennedy, to where he states emphatically they will never rest until they put Hoffa in jail, even if they have to trump up charges. Do you think they're going to put Hoffa in jail as a result of this trial? Not if I get a fair trial, and I have not received a fair trial here. The government deliberately hid evidence. The gov government deliberately used the court to hide evidence and the government has deliberately lied under oath. But these assertions failed to impress. In March 1964, Hoffa was found guilty of jury tampering. He received an eight-year sentence. 
Then in July, he was found guilty of the conspiracy and fraud charges as well. His sentence, a further five years in jail. Hoffa vowed to fight on and attacked his old and bitter enemy. I have been sentenced. I will appeal. I am not guilty. And I say to the millions of members of organized labor, have heed, because those who fight for you and fight to win will find that out of this conviction, the zeal of Attorney General Robert Kennedy will be to destroy you unless you give in. He walked off to begin his struggle to stay out of prison. He stayed on as president of the union, appointing his friend Frank Fitzsimmons vice president on the understanding that if imprisoned, he would take over again when released. Over the next two and a half years, Hoffer and his attorneys fought to keep him free. They accused the government of unconstitutional activities such as unauthorized wiretapping and the use of perjured witnesses, and they claimed that the charges had been trumped up as a result of the personal vendetta between Hoffer and Robert Kennedy. But in December 1966, Hoffer's last appeal failed and his convictions were upheld. On the 7th of March, 1967, journalists mobbed the president of the Teamsters Union as he reported to the US courthouse in Washington. Jimmy Hoffa was going to jail. It was a day he had thought he would never see. Now, with the handcuffs on his wrists covered by his raincoat, he entered Lewisburg jail swearing that he would never have to serve his full sentence of 13 years. Shortly before this, at a lavish dinner in his honor, one of the speakers had compared him to Jesus on the cross, with Bobby Kennedy on one side and informers from the Teamsters on the other. The years behind the grim walls were to prove bitter and humiliating. Once inside, he found that he was not getting any special privileges. But much of the membership stayed loyal, and a Teamsters local sent an airplane greeting on every Valentine's Day, his birthday. He remained the nominal president for the first four years, but Frank Fitzsimmons soon stopped paying much attention to orders coming from Lewisburg. The hand-picked stooge found that he enjoyed his new power and started looking for ways to make his temporary job permanent. While Hoffa's attempts to get parole were turned down, Fitzsimmons was strengthening his links with President Nixon, who was grateful for the support of a man with two million voting members and substantial funds. Nixon told Charles Colson, his presidential assistant, to do anything he could to be helpful. Colson and H.R. Haldeman discussed Hoffa's release on terms favorable to Fitzsimmons. They told junior counsel John Dean to draw up a document commuting Hoffa's sentence in such a way that Fitzsimmons could not be challenged by him. First, Hoffa resigned the union presidency. Then they wrote in a condition, which he didn't know about, that he couldn't take any further part in union affairs until 1980. On the 24th of December, 1971, President Nixon commuted James Hoffa's sentence. After four years and ten months, Hoffa was a free man. He seemed genuinely ignorant of any limitations. Were there any prohibitions placed upon your activity as far as getting back into labor management is concerned? I won't know that until I'm in Detroit on Monday and talk to the parole officer, who one of the rules of the release from prison will outline the conditions that I'll work under. I don't know. What do you think he was also tactful about the abilities of his supposedly temporary successor. Are you satisfied now that the union is in good hands in the hands of Mr. Fitzsimmons? Frank Fitzsimmons and I have been friends for over 40 years. Frank came off the truck when I first hired him. As I come out of a warehouse, he's an excellent administrator, knows the insides and out of the teams of the union just as well as I do, and has done an excellent job, and I'm sure he'll continue to do so. This cloud of goodwill was blown away when Jimmy Hoffa discovered that he'd been legally castrated. Fitzsimmons and the White House had made sure he would never work in the union again. 
he seemed totally amazed. Not until I was on the street and in St. Louis, Missouri, some several hours later, that I know there was a 1980 restriction. Back at home at his lakeside cottage, he discovered that it wasn't only the White House which preferred Fitzsimmons. The mob had found Fitz much easier to control, and Hoffa started making veiled threats in his constant phone calls to former colleagues as to what he might reveal in order to get reinstated. Meanwhile, Fitzsimmons was safeguarding his own position by donating a million dollars to Nixon's re-election fund. Hoffa's attempts to force the White House to publish the confidential documents relating to his release failed. So did his attempt to have the presidential limitation on his activities ruled unconstitutional. There was a rash of violent incidents. The car of Frank Fitzsimmons' son was blown up and supporters on both sides were physically attacked. Hoffa had also lost the friendship of Tony Provenzano by failing to back him in a pension scam. He was now a sworn enemy and dedicated to stopping Hoffa getting back into the Union. So it was foolhardy of Hoffa to agree to go to a meeting at the Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield Township, 15 miles northwest of Detroit. This was apparently with Provenzano or some of his Mafia colleagues to discuss making peace. Hoffa's last known movements were described by his son, James P. Hoffa. He left for an appointment at Max's Red Fox restaurant at approximately 1.30 p.m. Wednesday, July 30, 1975. He called home at approximately 2.15 p.m. We have not heard from him since. Hoffa had called in on his way to the Red Fox at a limousine company. There he mentioned that he was meeting Tony Provenzano and a colleague. He was seen waiting in the car park, looking angry. In his call to his wife, he said that he had been stood up. The last sighting of him was driving off in a car with three men. A nationwide search followed, with hundreds of leads and reported sightings being followed up, but nothing was found. The FBI became involved in the case on the 3rd of August because kidnap demands were received. All of these proved false. James P. Hoffa indicated one possible cause for his father's disappearance. Well, it's difficult to imagine anybody having a motive to harm my father or abduct him, and I would think that there must be some relationship back to the Union, although I cannot name names, and I, I really don't know names. One name he may have had in mind was Charles O'Brien, Hoffa's foster son. Chucky, as he was always known, had been brought into the Teamsters by Hoffa, but had defected to Frank Fitzsimmons. He disappeared on the 1st of August, and his union colleagues seemed perplexed by his behavior. Well, I have a question in my mind. Is it normal for a man not to show up to work and not call his boss? If you know Mr. O'Brien, most anything is normal. But when O'Brien reappeared after five days, he had a perfectly clear explanation. He had gone to Memphis to spend time with his new bride, and then on to Washington for a business meeting with Frank Fitzsimmons. He seemed equally perplexed when interviewed later. I came back because I came down here to visit my family and I get a phone call saying that I'm missing. And, uh, and ironically, it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was blown into a proportion that, uh, that I immediately came back to Detroit and uh, made myself available to anybody and anybody that is involved in the case that wanted to talk to me. Tony Provenzano and his Mafia associates were interviewed, but all had formidable alibis. For the FBI, the Hoffa case is still officially open, but their belief is that he never left the car he was seen driving off in alive. One theory has it that the three men were Mafia executioners who shot or garroted him as they drove along. His body was supposedly stuffed into an oil drum and buried deep in a dump that had served as a mafia cemetery before. Since his disappearance and assumed murder, Jimmy Hoffa has been recognized as a brilliant labor leader, whose links with crime were the downside of a ruthless dedication to his members. And my philosophy is very simple. The working man of America is being shortchanged every day in America. 
And I spent all of my life getting conditions, wages, and hours for workers in this country. And I stand on my record then and now. Like Faust, he made a pact with the devil. Like Faust, he paid the penalty. Alcatraz is one of the most famous and notorious prisons in the world. Over the years, it was home to some of the worst criminals in the US, some of whom tried to escape. Great Crimes and Trials is back next with some of those escape stories. Mm -hmm.